Hey, um, before you get stuck into this interview, I just wanted to give a, a little bit of context to the whole thing. For my for my recent series, Why You Need to Travel, which hopefully you've watched, and if you haven't, please go check it out. Um, I sat down with Abraham Joff and discussed a few things that I'd learned from him about filmmaking when you're first starting out. Abraham is a distinguished Australian cinematographer. He owns a production company in Sydney, and him and his team have worked on some incredible documentaries. Um, there's Tales by Light, which you can check out on Netflix, and just a load more um, really inspirational work and stuff that's really inspired and motivated me. So I highly recommend that you go check these out either before or after uh, listening to this interview because I think you'll you'll really enjoy those. In my series you you only see about 10 minutes of the chat and I wanted to, to share the full conversation because I really think there is so much value here um, especially for all of those of you out there who are aspiring filmmakers. So yeah I think if you're if you're planning on a career as a filmmaker you're just getting started someone like myself in the past few years um, grab yourself a pen and paper and just get stuck into this. You, you'll take a lot of notes and I think you'll come away with some real value. And yes, I know I need a haircut, but we're all stuck indoors, no hairdressers are open. First thing I wanted to sort of talk about was, um, I remember you, you said to me um, how important passion projects are and that I should always make sure that I've got something going in terms of passion projects. And I think one of the reasons that I was able to come and meet you in Sydney was because I sent you that video that I'd made about uh, Leon and Kathy up in the hills in Gippsland. Yes. Um, so, yeah. in your own words, why do you think um, passion projects are so important and why should people always be looking to, to keep them going? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I guess, Josh, look, one of the advices I used to get when I was first out of school, trying to you know, I knew that film or television storytelling was where I wanted to be. The advice that everyone used to give me is take every opportunity that you can, uh, particularly in the early days when every experience is knowledge in the bank and even a bad experience is knowledge in the bank. Um, so I've tried to always take that advice. Um, and I think um, you never know who you'll meet on a project, who you'll meet um, getting out there. The best, you know, they do say it's a bit of a cliche, but it's true. The best knowledge is is doing. Um, and I, I'll admit too, when I first started out, sometimes I'd be scared to take something on for fear of it not being good, you know, being judged on that. But I think it, it's, and I probably did, if I'm being honest, there were short films that I was interested in making, which I didn't necessarily make because I, I didn't feel I was ready or capable of doing it. But, you know, I should have done all of those things because even if you make something bad, you have you learn enormously every day just being out there making. So I would continue to tell young people um, that, you know, you should shoot and you should create. And if you're going to do that, particularly if you're not getting paid, why not in areas that are of interest to you? Not only do you learn more about those particular subjects that are important to you and, and, and you can give a voice to um, causes or even if it's not a cause, just something that's that's of interest. And, and, and another thing my uncle told me once that if you find something interesting, genuinely really interesting, there are going to be a lot of other people out there that also find it interesting, no matter how much of a niche it is. Um, and, and often the more niche something is, the more interesting it is inherently because it's something that people don't know about. So um, I just think there's a lot of value in it. And as I've progressed through my career and we've done more commercial work and other projects and, and obviously having a team, you know, not sometimes we do work that is still interesting, but it's, it's to pay the bills. Um, occasionally, well, every year we try to do something that is just purely of interest. It doesn't have to have a commercial um, output and, and it's often those um, short projects that have, get a lot of traction and they lead on to other exciting projects. Um, to give a couple of examples, you know, Ghost of the Arctic is a, is a short that we went up to Svalbard probably three or four years ago now and filmed on the back of snowmobiles, travelled and, and to go photograph polar bears. Now, that was not a paid job. Um, a friend of mine uh, 
had been planning this for a few years and sort of said, do you want to come along? And, you know, it was just pay your own way. But, you know, he, he had made the contacts to go and do that. And I mean, how could I say no? And so it was an investment in time and in money um, to go. It's not cheap to get up to the Arctic. But what an incredible experience it was. It would have been worth it alone for the personal experience. But, but on top of that, because we were driven by our excitement for the subject and the freedom of not having a, a brief, we could create exactly the piece we wanted to. Often people, their excuse was, well, this, the client wanted this or the client wanted that or I was limited by this or limited by that. But if you if you do have an opportunity to to go, and it doesn't have to be going to the Arctic. You know, I think you prove that as well. You know, a lot of the things I've done have been in backyards, um, you know, stories that are in your own city. Uh, every city has got them. It's interesting people, places. Um, so uh, it's it's just served me really well. Um, we also went to, um, and that polar bear film, has that led on to a whole range of other projects. And um, it was also a really nice piece to have as a portfolio piece because you know, we're proud of it. We can put it up there and say, this is what we, this is what we can do. Um, it's led on to commercial work and also other, other series and, and projects that some of them I can't talk about now because they're sort of in, in production. Um, mm. But it's been really amazing. And then likewise, we went down to South Georgia about 18 months ago. It was, it was November 17, or, uh, 18, November 18. And got an opportunity to go down and, and shoot down in South Georgia, we got drone permits, which were incredibly rare um, to get. And um, that was, um, uh, again, has actually led on to some pretty amazing contacts and um, and work. So, I mean, and, and on top of that, I just think it's really nice to have, um, for me, just an archive now of, of things, life experiences, and, and, and to be able to take a camera and document, um, obviously some people write, journals some people take photographs i think what we do with a camera shooting motion and sound together is the best record you know nothing can really compete with it and um so i feel very fortunate from a personal point of view to have all of these life experiences documented for my kids and for my personal history is really really nice probably i wish i had taken more footage of myself and my wife when she was working traveling with me and we often didn't point the cameras back at ourselves too much. Um, so that would be a bit of advice that I would give people is just do document your own journey as well. Um, it doesn't have to be a primary focus unless that is a personal blog or personal um, style, then that's great. Um, but I was always focused very much on the subjects that we were filming and did very little back at us. And I just think it would be nice now to have a little bit more of that material especially now that I've got um, quite a few years of it in the past. Um, having said that, I've still probably got quite a bit. So, you know, but you can always yeah. want more. And, and I think I've also learned time and time again, if you're unsure about whether you should be recording, you should be recording. Just record, 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 record. You know, data's cheap. Getting back to these places is, is, is not cheap or easy and so on's impossible. So... Um, yeah, and, and, and again, it's all a learning process. And you should look back at your work from a few years ago and, and, and just think, wow, I do things a lot better today or differently. Okay. And that's that means you're progressing and, and you're, you're learning. Um, but yeah, I think above all, I think what it does as well, and, and the reason that I, I want agreed to meet up with you is that I could see that, you know, you got out of your way, had initiative and created your own project that was really impressive. And that makes you stand out from the rest because it's very easy to say, oh, I, I want to do this or I want to do that. Um, and most people, that's as far as they get because the next step of actually going and doing it takes effort and time and commitment. But then they're the people who will get the interviews, get to get, you know, they'll get noticed. You'll get noticed and if that's what you want and, and that can lead on to some other fantastic opportunities. So, um yeah, that's a long-winded answer, but hopefully there's a few takeaways in there. That was great. I, I completely agree. Um, like, I, I look back at my old stuff, like you said, and now I'm like, wow, this is really pretty average. Uh, some of it was even quite bad, and I think to myself, I would do that a lot better now, but I only have that sort of hindsight having, you know, I've, I've gone through this big learning curve, and I, 
and you said to yourself it, it's progress it shows progress that i can look back and analyze the old stuff and see yeah how far i've come i mean i think the video i shared with you i've recorded the voiceover on my iphone um just some like really basic like audio mistakes and things like that which you know it like you said it's kind of it's nice to look back at that and and see the progression and it, it's kind of like i was making do with what i had at the time and it was it was enough to then um have have you see it and and say why don't you come along to sydney so i, I agree there's, there's always opportunities and doors that these passion projects can open for you next question i had was um why why is it important for young and upcoming filmmakers or just w whatever you're aspiring to do in life doesn't have to be filmmaking um why do you think it's important to have mentors and to meet people in your industry and get closer to the fire so to speak why is that so important and maybe you can talk from your own experience when you were filming crocodiles and everything up in australia why was that so important in your early early years yeah, it's a good question, Josh. I mean, I think, look, you are the company you keep. I think there's a lot of truth to that saying. Um, I also like the one, you know, it's better to be, well, I think most of the time you don't want to be a big fish in a small pond. I think it's really good. It's healthy. It's good for your ego to to expose yourself to, you know, truly great artists and, and people who you admire. And, and, you know, it can be something to aspire to. Um and keeps you hungry for learning and, and bettering yourself. And there's always so many more people that are better than yourself uh, out there. I think that's a really good thing to to do. Mentors, um, I mean, it's just, it's the soaking up the knowledge. Um, obviously, mistakes that you make yourself, they do burn deep and, and the knowledge sticks to you. I, I mean, I love that um, quote from Jerry Seinfeld, you know, pain is knowledge rushing in. To your body you know you stub your toe on the, on the side of the bed that's pain that's knowledge rushing into your brain it's, it's sort of true you know the the big mistakes that have been the most painful are the lessons that just set into your body and, and you really want to avoid those again so uh, and I've had plenty of those throughout my life um, and um, yeah I, I think um, it's 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 those reasons. I think it's just it's um, um, it's fantastic to have peers and and collaborators and then people that you look up to. I mean, recently a, a nice little moment for me was uh, well, two things actually have happened in the last year. One was well, one of the the first films that was very probably the most influential on me wanting to to follow make this a career was was Ron Frick's um, Baraka uh, and then later Samsara those films, but Baraka. I saw when I was a teenager and, um, you know, it's still incredible, um, you know, shot on 70 millimeter all around the world. And if, and if you ever have an opportunity to see it on a big screen, um, it's still played at certain cinemas. Um, it, it was just, it's just amazing. And it just blew my mind. Um, I'd never seen anything like it and it still, it still stands the test of time today. Um, and, um, recently one of my producer Louis sent Ron Frick an email with some of the work that we shot from South Georgia and he actually replied and and said it was beautiful cinematography he was very impressed and we got this email back from Ron which was which was amazing That's you know cool. for, to, to have that um and um you know what a you know his couple of lines meant so much um another little personal you know milestone was was um only a couple of months ago um We've got a, another project which is still unreleased, so I can't talk too much about it. But we we've been looking for a voiceover for um, for quite a while for it, and it's a it's a um, you know a, it's a public service announcement. It's not a commercial shoot. It was another passion project. And I have a friend who um, who's known David Attenborough for about forty years, and he he said, "Look, I'm happy to try to see if David would would do the voiceover." And he dropped it. He rode his bicycle across London about two months ago. And dropped off a USB at David's house um, in London and gave it to his daughter. David wasn't there that day. And a couple of days later, about four in the afternoon, we were just pottering around the house and my phone rang. I came into this seat right here and picked up the phone and it said, uh, is that Abraham? This is, this is David Attenborough speaking. <laughs> he rang me 
Um, unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't record the call, but he rang me very briefly, but just to say that um, thank you for thinking of him. He couldn't do it. He was off to Costa Rica, um, but, you know, he wished me well and um, he made, he gave, he, wow. you know, he, he gave me a personal phone call, which was pretty amazing. Wow. Um, what a moment, yeah. Yeah, so that was, you know, a couple of little, you know, a couple of heroes for mine to, um, yeah. to speak to and, and just, yeah, so it, they're special moments. Um, but um, but equally, it's fantastic to get feedback from anyone who, if your work can um, have an impact on somebody, that's that's all you can ever hope for. Particularly the space we're working in, where we're doing a lot of conservation and um, films that are sort of looking at issues around the world, and and we've sort of directed a lot of our work that way because that's my interest and the interest of the team. And so, yeah, if it's if it's changing attitudes towards whether it's sharks or you know um, rainforest, we've done quite a bit of climate stuff recently, which is still to be released. Um, yeah, then yeah, we feel like we're contributing a small in our small way uh, through the tools we have as filmmakers. Um, I completely agree. Like having those moments is so important where you just try and absorb as much knowledge as you can well i think yeah and yeah, no, i look it was great having you over to the studio and uh, i think also they i mean i don't know if i believe in the secret in those things where it's really you know um but i do believe in projecting where you want to be so i don't know if i believe it in a sort of a spiritual way but i think in a practical sense you know you have to believe and, and and if you're not thinking about it and writing it down and actually visualizing it, how is it ever going to happen? Because you, the first step is actually planning and then making, you know, a concerted effort to then move towards something and even telling people, it's like probably doing weight loss or something, you know, you tell people that you're doing a journey, then you're much more likely to follow through the physical act of yeah. actually talking about it. And then it just puts your mind in a different place. So I think going and surrounding yourself with people peers, mentors, or, or um, people you look up to. That's why going to conferences is so good and, and not being too much in a bubble, um, but actually interacting with others and, and going to film festivals and, and hopefully, you know, get maybe getting onto shoots yourself, getting being a, um, um, assisting, things like that. that. That is just invaluable in terms of um, seeing hopefully a future that you want to... Um, that you may want to, yeah. a path that you may want to go down. And equally, especially when you're starting out, it can be good for knowing what you don't want to do. Um, I, I I was an extra on a lot of uh, feature films in Sydney, just straight out of school when I was studying um, and a bit in high school as well. Um, and, and was, you know, I was in a, a bunch of different films and got to see the inner workings of a, of a, of a, uh, a feature film being made, particularly when back then sort of, uh, early 2000s, late 90s, there was a lot of, um, the Australian government had pretty good incentives for American films to come to Australia. And I think the dollar was, you know, in a good place for that. So there was a lot of films being made in Sydney. Uh, nice. And it was a good experience. Um, but then I realised after doing quite a few of them that it just wasn't an area that I was really, you know, hungry for. I just, you know, I had so much respect for, for feature filmmaking and I love watching films, but just the, the huge crews and the, the, the sort of glacial pace of production yeah, yeah. was just, it's not for me. You know, I, I love, you know, I've, I've soon learned that I'd love being really hands-on, small crews and real stories was sort of where I wanted to focus. Uh, and that's why documentary yeah. is where I ended up. I completely agree. That's, that's similar to what's happened with me in terms of, doing these videos for the marketing agency and making videos for businesses and social media and marketing. And I, I probably knew beforehand that it was documentary work that I wanted to get into, but that again, it was just another confirmation for me that that's where my passion really lies. Um, yeah. And I, I agree what you said earlier about uh, surrounding yourself with the right people and meeting um, people you look up to, it can be a real confidence boost. And f for me, after after I'd met you and your team, I came away from Sydney much more confident in what what I was going to do and who I wanted to be. Um, because before that, I didn't necessarily have the confidence to say to my mates and my friends, 
and my family, I, I want to be a filmmaker. So having seen everything there that day, it kind of confirms that I could do it. And from that, I was able to then tell my family, yeah, this is the career I'm now jumping into. I'm, I'm going to be a filmmaker. And just to say it, like you said, mm. just to say it, it confirms a lot and it puts you on that path, definitely. definitely. Yeah, great. Oh, well, if we had some, some tiny little uh, help in that, um, that makes me happy. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, so I've got one more question, and this is probably the the number one thing that stood out to me. The the thing that I took away was you you said probably several times you said just be patient. You know, patience is a really a key thing. Um, so you, I think you told me that you had only really started to do the documentary work maybe in your thirties and before that you were working on like other commercial stuff and maybe weddings and things that you weren't as passionate about. So why do you think, what, why is patience so important and not just in filmmaking, not just in this industry, but in any career path you take, why do you think patience is the key? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, you're right. I mean, I had a, an interesting journey because, and without going into it in too much detail, um, I mean, I left, um, I, I actually got into doco straight out of uh, high school and, and, and I did, I mean, less than a year of film school before I was up in the Kimberleys filming crocodiles and f working with um, a hero of mine, Malcolm Douglas, who was like the original Crocodile Dundee, who'd been making, he'd been making films since the early 60s. And then that led on to working for another fellow who was also another Steve Irwin type character, David Ireland, and um, had a couple of years of travel all around Australia and filming in um, East Timor and, and the Solomon Islands and, you know, diving and filming shipwrecks and sharks. And I was living the dream and I was 21. So I, I had a couple of years, three years of that. Um, and, but then was making very little money, but I didn't care. Obviously I was, you know, it was exciting and fantastic work and I was doing what I loved. Uh, it was very low paid. Um, and then in between trips was, you know, I wanted to move out of home and I wanted to get a bit of money. And so I, you know, corporate work and weddings just sort of came naturally and were quite easy and, and, and paid quite well. And, you know, it sort of drew me away from that work. Um, for a while and before I knew it, several years had gone by and, um, you know, I had quite a successful business, but I was sort of very, it pained me to think about, God, what if I had just stuck with what I was doing? You know, where would I be right yeah. now? And um, I had other friends who were chasing the sort of feature film career and had just sort of stuck it out working as, you know, clapper loaders or assistants. Um, in, um, in the film business, you know, for years, living at home, slowly trying to climb that ladder. But then had, some of them had progressed a long way in that time. And then I was still doing the corporate and weddings. Um, and it just, I got to a point where I thought, look, I have to, I have to give it a, a crack. And then, you know, when I talk about opportunity and, and not always taking a financial opportunity and really, I mean, why should people pay you to do what you want to do right at the beginning when you don't have the portfolio and it's like the cart before the horse, what comes first, chicken and the egg? How do you, and that's the biggest question you get asked by people, how do I become, you know, a wildlife or documentary filmmaker? How will I get any breaks when I haven't made anything, but how do you start? Because how do you get that first opportunity? And I think it comes down to, you know, if you are so committed to, to becoming that, you need to get out there and, and, and no matter what it takes, start shooting and producing. And so it will usually mean either your own passion project, which means if you can somehow um, fund that, well then no one's stopping you except yourself. Or if there are other opportunities for other people that maybe it's quite low paid, maybe there's no pay at all, then you know that's a calculated decision to, to take that on. Um, Having said that, I, I do also, because I went through periods of very little pay, whenever people ha do come and work for me on projects, even if they're given an opportunity, I always pay everyone because I feel like if someone's, if you're giving someone an opportunity, they're still working hard. They're still probably putting in 12, 14 hour days in the field and everyone has costs. Everyone's got rent to pay or board or 
a phone bill, and so I don't believe in paying people nothing. If they if 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 they're worth bringing on a shoot, they're worth paying, even if it's something modest. Um, and because I've been there myself, and I also feel when the days are tough and you do have moments of real struggle or uncomfortableness or you know exhaustion, if you're paying, if you're getting, if mentally, if you're getting paid nothing. It can be tough to drag you through those harder times, but if you're getting paid, even if you're getting paid a very modest amount, you're still make getting paid, and this is the psychological thing. So, I'm probably contradicting myself, but I do believe in that as well. So that's how I operate. Um, but having said that, sometimes you do take no pay at all. So, for example, my break w when you asked about corporate to the doco is that I had some opportunities to go to Africa. It, it, it arose from. Um, actually talking about it you know we talk about the power of your words I, I rarely talked about the work that i did back with malcolm douglas and david island because i was proud of it of the work that we did but because i'd left it behind and i had a um i i was sort of quite um disappointed in myself for not pursuing that then i didn't like to talk about it because people might think, well, why did you start doing corporate or weddings and we're just chasing the dollars? You gave up on your dream. So it was a bit, I felt ashamed that I didn't stick it out. So I didn't talk about it. And one day I started talking about it with a friend who happened to be working at Canon and he had a love of Africa and he was talking about his African photos. He'd done a couple of trips. And it was only then when I, re I revealed that, well, actually I did have a past in wildlife and diving and filming and he didn't even know about it because I never talked about it. And, and once he knew that, he knew what's you know he, he thought highly of my camera work and then when he knew that he then mentioned it to a fellow who was running these high-end photographic safaris and that opportunity came up and then he came and it was interesting too. talk about taking an opportunity he came to my studio in sydney which was a wedding studio primarily to come and have a meeting because my friend had talked talked me up to him and i knew the sorts of amazing trips he did across africa many countries in Africa, all wildlife, but high-end safaris. So, you know, the best low-impact sort of tourism, photography-based, um, so really attractive. Um, and I'd never been to Africa. So I was thinking he was coming over and I thought, I can't just show him weddings or corporate. You know, he's he, he won't be able to see past it. And I thought, I need to show him some wildlife. And, and, and in the morning, he was coming in at 2 or 3 in the afternoon. That morning, I, I just grabbed... I think it was a 1DC camera. So it was an early 4K camera and a, and a long lens. Um, it was a, you know, a th I think it was a 300 mil. It was a really nice lens I had. And I just grabbed a tripod and I went to Trongle Zoo and I put it in a backpack and I went to the zoo and I went around and filmed a bunch of animals in 4K. Um, I might've got the camera wrong. Maybe it was a 5D. Anyway, it doesn't matter what it was, but I, I, sh I shot a whole bunch of animals, um, got some really nice tight detail shots and, um, you know, all zoo animals in cages, but you know, just to show off the image quality, um, this guy was a photographer and didn't know anything about filmmaking, came back, did a bit of a grade, put it up on a big TV, the best TV we had. This is probably 2012, I think, 2011, 2012. Um, and he came in and then I, you know, he saw the studio and then I showed him this footage, this wildlife footage. And, um, and, and you know, I didn't pretend it was shot in the wild. I said it was the zoo, but I wanted to show him the image quality and, you know, and he was amazed. And also I think he liked the initiative. He, he liked the fact that I went and shot this to show him yeah. what was possible. And I think that maybe that was more important to him. Just like your initiative was impressive to me. And then you want to give people breaks. I mean, you, you want to give people opportunities that show initiative because it's just, it's a small percentage of people who do. And I think, you know, it's also nice to reward people who put in the effort. It also shows commitment. And you know that if you give them the opportunity, they'll take, they will grab it with both hands. And so on the spot within an hour, he basically stuck out his hand. He said, all right, come to Africa. I'll fly you out. You can come on a one month trip um, across um, South, Af South Africa and um, and Namibia and come and film this um and that was it, you know, it was incredible. And I got to go and, and shoot this and it was for no pay, but my costs were covered, my flights and the, the trip itself, which was probably a $20,000 trip. Um, and I was able to have relative freedom with the, the stuff, the content I produced. Yes, I was making content for him, but I could really go to town with however I wanted to shoot it. And um, it was incredible. And then that sort of really helped me um, 
There was another opportunity with Canon, which came along too. I'll, I'll, I'll briefly tell you that one because I think that's also another example of, yeah. of a break. And it was around the same year. Um, or it might have even been the wildlife stuff that got me to gig with Canon. So, I mean, so that, that leap of faith or that sort of going out on a limb, putting a bit of initiative, taking no money and doing it to give myself that opportunity. Yes, now that I'm thinking about it, that, that footage then and, and my friend at Canon who saw some of the material got me a little break with Canon. So Canon, you know, if that hadn't happened, they probably would have seen me as a, a wedding guy. Why would they have asked me to shoot yeah. a series of short content pieces for their Canon Masters? So Canon Masters are the sort of the sponsored um, professionals at um, that use the Canon equipment. And now one of the photographers that they asked me to film, the very first one was a guy called Darren Jew, who's an underwater um, photographer. And actually now, you, if anyone's seen him in Tales by Light, they'll know who Darren is and uh, he's got and at the time he'd spent many many years going to Tonga and photographing and swimming with the humpback whales and I knew I met Darren a few times and I I you know I had a diving background and I always said wow I'd love to come one day and um and so suddenly Canon were asking me to do a film on him and they they had a budget of a few thousand dollars it was not a lot of money and it was they asked me to go and film an interview with him and then it was basically him talking about his work and we we're going to show some photographs and probably you know a sit down interview and then overlay with photographs simple you know you could shoot it in in a few hours and you could cut it together and have it do it in a couple of days and even if it was very well produced it would be okay you know someone talking about their work and i spoke to darren and and quickly realized that i've got to go to tonga i've got to swim with the whales with him and and film him in the field and i came back to canon i said look we will i will Instead of doing this, I take your same budget. If you cover maybe the flights, so and I think I asked for a little bit more money, but it was very little, just a bit of extra costs. I will go and take a drone pilot, friend of mine, Toby, to uh, Tonga, and the, and we will shoot him in the field. And it was too good an op- offer for them to refuse, and they said fine. So we had, you know, again, it was it was a you know we did it for probably under cost because I probably spent more money doing it than than whatever it was paid. But that's not the point. The point was just taking that leap and then producing that piece of content. Now that that short film that we made about Darren and we, we did the first droning of the humpbacks, I'm sure, in um, that it had been shot. This was twenty twelve, I think. Or thirteen. Early days drones. Very early yes. days. Yeah, there was no inspires, there was no Phantom. The Phantom wasn't even out. So it was a hexcopter that was built by hand by him and um, this is back when you when you flew it, everyone stopped no matter where you were because they'd never seen anything like it. And now drone, no one cares about yeah. a drone. It's so funny how things change. But so we were flying a home built hexcopter with a, I think with a Canon camera on it. That was the deal. And I'm terrified of that over the water. Oh yeah, <laughs> it was. And in fact, we did we did crash it on land. Day two, you know, there was some interference, and then he managed to pull the thing back together and rebuild it, which nice. was amazing. And um, and I got in the water and got this incredible footage, and then it was just it was just in, you know an amazing experience. Came back, and then that piece of content was one of the most successful pieces of content that they'd ever put out in in Australia for Canon. They they told me it was just it went gamebusters, and that led on long story to Tales by Light. Uh, I don't have to get into the full details, but it was that really that set off a chain of events that led to that whole series, and then yeah everything else. So you know, a, a long story, but I think hopefully the lessons learned in there is that, you know, I, I took some jumps to to make the projects materialize. And and if I had just sat from day one going, well, look, this is my day rate, this is how it's going to work and um, take it or leave it, then those things wouldn't have happened. Um, so sometimes it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not always about just devaluing yourself. It's a calculated risk sometimes going, you know, this is worth it. And knowing... You know, being able to communicate to the person that's giving you an opportunity to say, "Hey, look, you're taking maybe a punt on me, but I'm taking a punt, you know, as well, and I'm going to put in a huge amount of effort here." And 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 you know, I think both in both those examples, people had a, an offer they couldn't refuse, and and I had an opportunity I couldn't have had anywhere else. And so it opens those doors. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I've learned that myself, not just from you, but I've adopted the same sort of idea where. It's show me, don't tell me. So if I, for example, when I was with the marketing agency, we wanted to sort of do some property videos, but we didn't have any property videos in our portfolio. 
So I contacted various um, property developers in the UK and I said, let me come and film this for free um, so that we can put it in our portfolio and they get the value of that video. Um, yeah. And you're completely right. We got the video, it was great. And then off the back of that, it opened up more opportunities to do more of that work. Um, that's yeah. happened several times. Um, it's, it's probably the most valuable um, lesson I've learned doing this so far. Whenever you need to, to get somewhere, just take that leap of faith and and go for it and put the work up front and one way or another, it, it will work out and you, you end up getting to, to where you want it to be anyway. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. So, yeah, I think it's... Um, um, and, and look, I mean, people hit on millennials and say that, you know, in generalised, probably every generation does that. Um, baby boomers were probably were the hippies and, you know, everyone looks down on the, the next generation. It's probably just human nature. But... Um, I hope that, that the millennial um, set, if, 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 you know, if the generalizations are true, which I don't think they are, but if they are, that, you know, that things are handed to you on a platter, they're not, you know, I think that's the lessons that young people should take is that, you know, you do need to make your own opportunities as much as possible. And, and hopefully stories, if you hear stories like this, um, it can be maybe a bit of a, a bit of inspiration to take those leaps um, and take every opportunity. And, and, and look, I've, I've worked on little short films and all, all sorts of things. Uh, I, as I said, I was an extra. Um, I did loads of little things and, and there was little lessons learned all along the way. Um, and, and also it, it helped guide me to where I wanted to be. And I guess that's why work experience is good because people do work experience and figure out whether they either love it or, they, or it's not for them. Because a perception, yeah. before you're actually in it and living and breathing it, uh, it's hard to know the reality can be very different from the perception um, with, with things. I think, you know, there's nothing like being there. Um, and certainly filmmaking is less glamorous than it appears to be. And and the hard times, you look at the finished films and it's very easy to forget all the struggles and, and the how hard it was to make the content and, and how exhausting or zero sleep or freezing cold or heat yeah. or humidity. Um, but... You know, I think uh, for anyone else like you and I, you know, we do love it. And I think when you're out there and making it, you just try not to take it for granted because we're so lucky to be out there in the field doing things most people would dream of doing. And um, it's yeah. a career. So I do feel very fortunate, even though it's long, it's been a long road to get there. I don't take it for granted even today. And then particularly now with this lockdown you sort of look back and go, God, maybe I did take it for granted because now when, once something's taken away from you, your freedom to move, um, yeah, you realise what you true. had. So um, I think, yeah, just got to enjoy every day. And, and um... I agree. And leaning into what makes you happy, I've learned that it's really, at the end of the day, it's not about the money, although obviously we all need money to survive and you need the, the finances to work out. But what's more important is that you are doing the work that fulfills you and makes you happy. And I've, I've tried to use that as a North star, um, because I think for people my age, you, you know, as we're getting into the industry, you are looking maybe at what's going to get you the money to stay afloat and keep going. So it's a fine balance. Sometimes you've got to, you've got to sort of, sometimes you have to do that commercial work that you don't necessarily enjoy that much, but if you can keep yeah. leaning into the stuff that you're passionate about and the stuff that makes you happy, yeah. that's the most important thing. I think thing. you're right. I don't also want people to think that, you know, I don't want them to get the wrong idea to say that, you know, that I would just, you know, that I'm a purist and that we only do the stuff that is amazing and, and you know, fulfilling and, you know, it's not true. You know, we still do work that is more of a grind, more of a corporate, you yeah. know. I mean, as I've been trying to get, all of our work to be at least in the space of the natural world and it's getting there so even if we're doing a corporate piece that at least it's in nature or there's some tie to the outdoors it's you know and and because of our portfolio then you are generally thought of in that space and so people will gravitate to you for an idea and sometimes you can plant an idea in, in someone's head about an uh, possibly a a commercial project that's another thing you can start to do if you have the work to back it up and say look have a look at this and this we can do this for you approach brands and there's nothing i mean there's nothing wrong with working for brands and you know you do need to pay the bills and particularly i've got some staff you know we've got a team i've got to make sure everyone's paid and so there's in this business there's ups and downs um 
with cash flow and um, but everyone needs to be paid every week so you know those jobs can be um, really handy to have and so yeah it's um, there's nothing wrong with with doing that and and for a while you may need to be doing other work that you not that's not um, 100 percent where you want to be um, but um, if I look back at the things that brought me to where closer to where I want to be they were leaps they were um, getting out of the comfort zone a little bit and um, and I think if you play it too safe you can just get maybe stuck in a in a in a little circuit that you don't want to be in so um, yeah yeah it's it's just a I think you constantly need to reassess where where you're at what you're doing and and try to try to find the balance um, because we've all got to yeah. eat and we've all got to pay rent or a mortgage and so yeah um, and then when you have a family then it makes it even harder and I think I mean I started my journey well before I was married and had kids but hearing people talk I think it could be tougher to make these big big sort of changes of career or making huge decisions once you have the responsibility of a family and children that would make it harder because um, yes, you've got 100%. all this responsibility and I think so if you are single or even if you're married, but, but you know, before children, before that sort of, um, that res that weight of responsibility, then it is a, probably an easier ask. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm in that sort of spot now where um, me and my girlfriend have made this decision that we're going to go to Indonesia and I'm leaning hard into the passion projects over the next year or so. But you're right, I wouldn't necessarily have taken this risk if I was more settled, if I had kids and everything, because it is, it just makes, it can make decisions like that a lot bigger and a, a lot harder. So yeah, I agree. That's yeah. in the back of my mind that at some point in my thirties, you know, I'm, I'm going to have kids. And then at that point, hopefully you're a bit more settled um, and obviously further yeah. on down the line. So, and you'll never regret, look, even if you go to Indonesia um, and have a couple of years where, you know, have these incredible life experiences, you'll always have that, you know, even, if, you know, yeah. I, I mean, I feel really positive for you, but, you know, what is the downside? You know, stay safe, of course, That's it. touch wood, yeah, but, you know, you will amazing. have um, these incredible life experiences and the travel I did with my wife before kids uh, was yeah. was amazing and, and my parents did two and a half years around Europe in their, in their early years yeah. and probably, you know, if they just stuck their nose to the grindstone working back home for those two and a half years yeah maybe they get a bit further ahead financially but does that matter you know now at this stage in their life they're they've, they've paid their house off anyway they've had an amazing life they've done a lot of travel yeah. we did three years around australia when i was a teenager um which was you know amazing and a childhood that you can only dream of you know um and definitely set me on a path of wanting to work in in um in the big wide world and I think, yeah, you, you cannot put a value on those experiences. So, you know, I would encourage my kids to do the same and, you know, have a gap year and yeah. go and do these things, you know. It's it's cliche, but it is, it's the experiences that that really matter. Um, the whole idea of me doing this, this video series is to show that, like, through travel, it, it gave me uh, the time and the space to, to focus on all of those little films that I was putting on my YouTube um, it allowed me that time and space to really sort of just explore that, uh, and then yeah, through that I had I suddenly had this this portfolio without realizing at the time I kind of built a portfolio that was enough um, enough for me to end up when I came back to the UK. Um, the idea was very much I was gonna just get a job that would sort of keep a roof over my head to keep the bills paid. And then I was just going to sort of grind it out and try and do free jobs here and there and film bits and bobs and just sort of slowly build my way up. But I was very fortunate in the fact that um, somebody reached out having seen the work that I had posted from my travels and they thought that was good enough for them to reach out and offer me a, a position as a videographer. So it just it goes to show that right. even if you don't realise it at the time that the work you're doing, the passion projects, they, they are going to, they're going to open doors every time. Every mm. time. Yep. So. Yep. hundred percent. That's, that's great. Well, it's good. I mean, it's good you're doing this, um, 
this this is this a web series or it's a um, a journal? What what are we doing? Yeah, it, it's um it's a series for YouTube. I'm just going to put it off on my YouTube, and it's basically um yes, yeah, it's, it's four four parts, and I just think that those few years where I was traveling were so important and so transformative for me. I'm sure that there are other people out there who are maybe in a position where I was before, where I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I just wanted to put this out there so that if someone happens to watch it and then they realize, oh, maybe I should go do a bit of travel or get out there and sort of get out of your comfort zone and go experience other things. And perhaps through doing that, they realize that they want to Maybe they want to be a filmmaker, maybe they want to be an author, whatever it is, hopefully by getting that those new experiences and, and sort of getting to know yourself more, that they can figure out what it is that they want to do. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's great, mate. Well, that's good on you. I think it's really, really good you're doing that. And um, hopefully there's been a few little... Um, you know, little nuggets in there somewhere when we talk. But yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks for the time. It means a lot. Yeah. No, mate, mate, my pleasure. And um, yeah, let me know when it's live, and we'll um, and yeah, if there's anything else you need, just let me know. Nice one, mate. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'll I'll let you know, and we'll keep in touch. Awesome. All right, mate. Well, good luck, and stay safe during the lockdown. <laughs> yeah, you too. Hopefully, we're out of this soon. All right. <laughs> yeah. Take care, mate. Cheers, mate. Bye. Bye.